Good afternoon, everybody. I'm talking something more uncommon than what I discussed the uh, day for yesterday. I was talking about uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Today is a very interesting case where you have to learn certain, I would say, philosophy behind the treatment of this patient. This is a patient of a case of unknown primary. At least in American literature, it's used the word CUP. In our uh, days when we were students, it used to be known as occult primary. Or somehow they have changed the terminology to unknown primary, and it makes no difference. As far as I am concerned, I am going to discuss only only one part of it. Now I am going to discuss only a particular patient who comes with level two and probably three. The moment you go to level four, the discussion becomes too vast. All of you know supraclavicular nodes can get uh, you know. Secondary deposits from various tumors, it just cannot be discussed in one class. So I restrict myself to what you see sometimes in clinical practice. And these are usually seen in men, usually over the age of 60. Most of them are smokers, tobacco chewers, especially in this country, and alcoholics. What do they come by? They come with an asymptomatic swelling, stress on the word asymptomatic. Other than a swelling, they do not have any other symptoms usually in the upper part of one side of the neck. The duration is usually months, occasionally weeks, but the rate of growth is quite rapid. They do not have any symptoms referable to any primary in the head and neck region. I want to stress again at this point. There are no symptoms. All of you have seen patients with carcinoma cheek, carcinoma the tongue, carcinoma oropharynx, etc., etc., coming to with symptoms referable to primary as well as neck nodes. Understand that, but here is one group of patients who have absolutely asymptomatic swelling. I stress again, these are painless swelling. Therefore, what I said in the first class, people tend to neglect. I repeat what I said in the first class, painless swellings are neglected. Pain worries patients, blood frightens patients. This is a typical Indian ethos. Is it right or wrong? Let us not discuss. Now, when you examine, you'll find a swelling corresponding to level 2. I will not go into various details, you know. Straight away, the moment you see and uh, uh, locate it, it corresponds to level 2 lymph node. Usually, there's single swelling. Occasionally, level 3 also may be present. And a small number can multiple lymph nodes extend to other areas. But most important, if there's a level 3 node and a level 2 node, more often than not, these nodes are adherent to each other forming a single mass. Size is, at least in our country, what we see, most of them are beyond six centimeters. Therefore, all of you know it belongs to N3. I'm sorry, I've written there already. Most of them belong to N3. On palpation, you find the consistency is hard. Mobility, usually there are a slight amount of transverse mobility, but some of them, by the time they read the hospital and examined by you, they're hard. The most important anatomical plane. I'm sure all of you know that level two nodes are deep two, the sternum master and in relation two. Come on, somebody answer in relation two. What's the apexia? What's the structure deep to the node? Level two. What is the terminal used in the past? What are the terminal? The, this terminal is diagastric. Jugular diagastric, that's right. So what is sitting deep to the uh, node is the interjugular vein. Interjugular vein. And uh, this is as far as examination you find. The heart swelling, usually more than six centimeters. It's uh, either slight mobility is present or it's fixed. What structure is fixed to? You see, in the neck, we use the word fixed. What is the structure interested in? Deep fascia. Deep fascia. Who said that? What happens to deep fascia when you come to sternum, my said, my dear friend? Structure fixed to deep fascia are fixed, is it? Deep fascia is a fixed structure. What happens to deep fascia investing over there? I'm talking investing with the deep thoracal fascia. What happens to it when it leaves the sternum, my stride? Splits into two to enclose the muscle. And I'm talking about swelling which is deep to the sternum, my stride. Understand that? So what is behind? 
Usual NSA is fixed at least near the midline superior vertebral fascia. You understand that? A fixed swelling because superior vertebral fascia is a fixed fascia. But investing layer, etc., are not fixed. Right. Now, you are expected to look for some pressure effects. One of them is distal pulsation. This swelling extend. I'll show the picture next. This swelling extend almost up to the level of the mandible. So there's no place for in the neck to feel the carotids. So therefore, the only distal vessel which can easily be felt is the superficial tempera. Surprisingly, more often than not, they're present. Next purpose, they're not good, which are the nerves which could be related. Suppose the swelling is fixed. They're expected to look for uh, infiltration, involvement of certain nerves. Which are they? Which are they? Spinal accessory. Yes, please. Spinal accessory. Uh, which one? Spinal accessories. I didn't hear. Cranial nerves or spinal nerves we are talking about now? 11th cranial nerves. 11th. Yeah, 11th usually enters the sternum muscle a little lower down. I would agree with that. But more important, what do you find in the carotid bifurcation? Vagus answer. Hypoglossal. 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 Oh. You do not see involvement of both these nerves, but I think in the examination, it's safer to say to look for 11th and 12th nerve involvement. Both are involved or not involved. Chances of involvement are compared to less, but as a part of an ex clinical examination, examiners expect you to examine for 12th nerve and 11th nerve. Occasionally, in a small number of patients, you may have lymph nodes on the opposite side. I'm not going to discuss the management of that. We'll restrict ourselves only to the first group. Now, this is the typical patient that you see in this country. You find that swelling extends so far is much beyond six centimeters, and this is totally fixed to the deeper structure. This is a classical presentation of an Indian patient with a case of unknown primary. Is otherwise very, uh, you know, no symptoms at all. He has not bothered about swelling. Some of them do apply some counter irritation. Some of them would have gone and taken some alternative medicine. Only when the swelling reaches this side, they feel that it's something dangerous. And this is the time they usually come to the hospital. Now, our first business is to make sure that we are discussed COP and not a second deposit. Of course, if, if, because you're in the neck, I have written thyroid and larynx. Both are low priority. Can you tell me the reason why? Both are low priority. I have written it because it's expected of you to say the thyroid gland is not enlarged. They are expected to say, what's the laryngeal sign which can be made out in the neck? Malignancy of the larynx. What is the neck Focus sign? sign. What? Huh? Yes, Focus. please. Huh? Focus sign. What is that? The laryngeal crepitus. Right. A click or crepitus, whatever you want to call it. Right. Okay, fine. It, they present in the extrinsic tumors or intrinsic tumors? I'm moving to interne, uh, ENT areas, but even then, basic knowledge is important. Extrinsic or intrinsic? Common sense. Common sense. Intrinsic. Intrinsic, my dear girl. Huh? Okay, extensive, but then invariably by the time the laryngeal click is absent, they would have had symptoms referable to the primary tumor. Yeah. As, as far as thyroid is concerned, they're expected to tell the examiner thyroid is not enlarged, but I say low priority. Why? Why? What's the commonest? Lateral swelling. Yes, please. What's the commonest malignant in the thyroid gland? Statistically, Right. What are the uh, type of nodes that you get in papillary carcinoma? They are soft. Oh. Which are the groups that are primarily involved? Level uh, 6 and 3. Involved, but I am not saying not involved, but usually they present with? Level 6 and level 3. Six, 3 and 4 actually. 3 and 4. And more important? More important? More of them not, they are bilateral. Central group of lymph nodes. Why do papillary carcinoma, you suppose let's restrict it to the upper pole on the right side, can it produce lymph nodes on the opposite side of the neck? I want a quick answer from Zaya. Yes, quick answer from Zaya. Multicentricity of the two. Multicentry is a theory that has been given up long, long time ago. I'm sorry, my dear boy. If you had appeared for the exam with me in 1964, I got a gold medal, but no longer true. 
this theory is no longer valid. I'm sorry. The upper pole will go to level three group of link node. I am asking about opposite side. Can a papillary carcinoma restricted to one low produce lymph nodes on the opposite side of the neck? Yes. So very important question in relation to papillary carcinoma. I'm sure somebody will discuss carcinoma thyroid with you by this time. So many classes. Abdul Kadir, come on, quick. TV is a short form of somebody. Come on, TV. I can see only three names here. The basics, absolutely basics. The In man the also spread Yes, please, uh, from lady's voice. Come on, quick. Okay. Interthyroidal spread will be present. Excellent answer. You have a group of lymphatics which covers the entire gland. These are called intraglandular lymphatics. They carry the tumor cell from the right upper pole to level four on the opposite side. Understand that? Multicentric origin is no longer accepted by most people. Intragland lymphatic because you know papillary carcinoma predominantly spreads via the lymphatics. The group of lymphatics is called intraglandular lymphatics. That's the reason why even though a papillary carcinoma localized to one single area, invariably we perform the standard operation for papillary carcinoma thyroid today is, is total therapy. Standard operation for a, a papillary carcinoma thyroid is Total thyroid. Total thyroid. I mean, this is one reason. Understand that? So thyroid is, but there are hard lymph nodes secondary to thyroid carcinoma, but they occur in very uncommon variety of medullary carcinoma or even worse, anaplastic. By the time a patient has lymph nodes in the neck, the primary tumor in the thyroid with medullary or anaplastic would have produced symptoms and signs. So I mentioned this in, for the examination sake, you're expected to say the thyroid gland is not enlarged, the laryngeal click is abs at present. This is just for a completion examination. Next, we go on to oral cavity. You must have a methodology of examining the oral cavity during inspection. To start from the lip. Please remember you've got to avoid the lip and look at the inner aspect of the lip. I got to go and examine the buccal mucosa, go on to the retromolar trigone, then come to the opposite side, examine the lateral margins of the tongue, ante two thirds, ask the patient to the tongue, close the mouth, and then look at the palate. Somehow, many students have got a soft corner for the soft palate. I do not know the reason why. Always say hard and soft palate, clinically on inspection, are normal. But there are two areas which are not visible on inspection, which has to be palpated. That's why I've written there, posterior one third of the tongue and the tonsils. What do you look for? What do you look for when you feel? <coughs> what, you, what sign do you look for when you feel the posterior one third of the, uh, the tongue as well as the tonsil? What sign do you feel for? Quick. Vaishnavi, quick. Vaishnavi, quick. What is the sign of a, uh, you know, I'm coming to that squamous cell carcinoma. What is the sign? Induration. Induration, absolutely right. So the tonsil may appear normal, but when you feel the induration. At this stage, one PG question. Can a growth in the posture one third of the uh, tongue produce changes in the anterior two, uh, two thirds, which is visible on inspection? I've given you the almost, I put the answer in your mouth. It's an inspection sign made out in the anterior two thirds when the primary is in the posterior one third. Come on, quick. Little difficult. Little difficult. Uncommon. Difficult. I have not seen. Yes, please. Difficulty in protrusion of the tongue. My dear girl, I've been saying from uh, the first minute onward, we are talking about asymptomatic swellings. The sign I'm looking for is macroglossia due to lymphatic obstruction. I have not seen one, but it's described in books. Understand that? Gross in the posterior one third of the tongue due to lymphatic blockage can produce macroglossia in the anterior two thirds. Described in books, but I have not seen one. But you have got to remember this point. They may ask you. And at the end of all this, your uh, conclusion is that 
there is no evidence of primary tumor. If we see something, my discussion will stop at this stage because I'm talking of an unknown primary. So, but a thorough inspection and a palpation must be done. Therefore, then we go on to investigations. Forget about the false positive that has come up for some of The first thing is to prove that it's malignant. We know it's hard. We know clinical is malignant, but you put a needle, you do an FNAC, you'll find a squamous cell carcinoma. How do you diagnose squamous cell carcinoma under the microscope? What do you look for? Exactly. He has down the line, the answer has not changed. That's something great. Keratin pearls are a manifestation of differentiation. Keratin pulse occur in a differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Every postgraduate pan south. I don't today there must be a student from North India, I don't know. Pan south, wherever I have gone, the moment I ask this question, the answer I get is keratin pearls. Keratin pearls are nothing but a sign of differentiation. They do not to diagnose malignancy, look at the cell. And the cellular changes are one. Keratin is a result of the Differentiation. Please, have, is it understood? I'm confusing you. Is it understood, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, the keratin pearls tell you it's a differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Keratin, to diagnose squamous cell, you look at the changes in the cell which are learned in your third year pathology hyperchromatism, anisonucleosis, blah, 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 all those things. Say that and don't say keratin, but this is a classical PG answer. To be, I don't know. Whenever I have been taking class, this is the first answer I get. Uh, Pan South Indian College, I would say. The next step is. To sir, please repeat. Sir, please. Sir, please I repeat once again. Uh, I'll repeat again. Okay, fine. What I'm trying to tell you is absence of keratinization can still be a squamous cell carcinoma, but then it fits into an undifferentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Remember, keratin formation is a sign of differentiation. When the tumors become well differentiated, which luckily is much more common than undifferentiated, you tend to think of keratin pearl the moment somebody talks of squamous cell carcinomas. But at a PG level, I would accept this at an MBBS level straight away. At a PG level, keratin pearls are indication of a differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. If the tumors are undifferentiated, if the tumors are anaplastic, you, the cells do not go to the stage of the keratinization at all. Am I clear now? Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. 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 Fine. I'll proceed. Now, I personally believe a pan endoscopy should be the first step for the simple reason it's much less expensive. You get an ENT colleague to do an endoscopy right from the nasopharynx down up to as far as you can see. And if it picks up a primary, well, the discussion stops here. But in the case I am discussing, you will find that everything is normal. There are people who look at a mucosa, and especially when the CT is done, and it's a CT shows some. That's why there are people who do a CT scan first, and if there's an area of thickening or they suspect they take what is known as blind biopsy. Multiple side blind bi biopsies are taken. Invariably, they come as negative. The small group of surgeons to go to the extent of doing bilateral or at least a tonsillectomy on that side. If you go through the literature, there's one group which says tonsillectomy should be done, and the group which says tonsillectomy should not be done. I think, example, you say tonsillectomy, they're going to ask you why. The only answer you can give is, Small tumors which are restricted within the tonsil may not show induration and therefore just to rule out a small primary in the tonsil, I do a tonsillectomy, it's not a wrong answer. Next we go on to CT scan. Please remember when you scan, you're going to do a head and neck scan. That means you're looking for primary right from nasopharynx right down. Understand that? And literature, these are Western figures, I don't have Indian figures. 25% of them may show a primary tumor, in which case, again, the discussion stops here. It's no longer unknown primary. The CT is important in the neck, especially when the, there is some degree of mobility to know whether the particular uh, lymph node or group of lymph nodes can be resected or not. And once the carotid sheath is involved by the malignancy, 
uh, cancer becomes inoperable. Of course, today, the pet of all the oncologists is the PET CT scan. Only thing is, the cost factor is the one thing, availability is another thing, but when present, it is said that the PET scan, CT scan has improved. Now, before PET came, if you look at all head and neck cancers, as high as 9% had COP. With the advent of PET, it's come down to 3%. But the sad part is the next point. False positives are responsible for 20%. So one cannot, again and again, I emphasize the importance of clinical examination over investigations. PET doesn't, does help you. It increases the uh, percentage of patients who show a primary tumor and you take them out of the CUP group. But unfortunately, as high as 20% are false positive cases. So these scans have their own limitation. Now at this stage, you have got to understand what is called as occult primary sites where tumors are difficult to detect. First is the nasopharynx. I'll put next number two, posterior one third of the tongue. Now the next two fossa are Rosenmuller and valvular pyriform fossa. I'll show you a little later. The subglottic area. Remember what is at the level of the vocal cords and above the vocal cords within the larynx can easily be made out. But a subglottic area, of course, today you've got modern endoscopes. You can take a, a turn and visualize in the days gone by, subglottic areas extremely difficult to identify. This was one of those areas. Now, uh, I'm sure your anatomy knowledge is more than six years old. Am I right? Minimum, I'm saying. I'm sorry. In some cases, maybe more than that. Minimum is six years old. So to refresh your anatomy, I thought I'll show you the frozen Muller's fossa. This is the cut section, you can see the turbinates of the nose, and what they're showing at the top, you can see B refers to, refers to a station tube, and next to that is a fossa that you see, is a fossa of Rosenmuller. That's part of the nasopharynx, but as I said, I think maybe in the first or second class, there are certain terms used to make medical student life more miserable. This is one of those areas, because the fossa is a part of the nasopharynx itself, but we want to specialize in that area. And we come to next is the valvular fossa. Look at this, what you see in the topmost portion, the base tongue, and you can see the epiglottis. Of course, you can't see the anatomical structure that connects the two. Can anybody tell me the name of the structure which connects the tongue to the epiglottis? Very epiglottic. Very, very epiglottic? Folds. Oh, I say better to call it. Loss of epiglottic fold. Okay, fine. On either side of that is what you see is known as the valvular. Valvular. You come down on either side of the prominence of the larynx, you see the pyriform fossa. Pyriform. Of course, today the instrumentations are far better than what we used to see. Days gone by, we used to only have a mirror. Today I've got beautiful endoscopes. So chance of missing a primary tumor either in the valvular or in the pyriform fossa has come down considerably. That's why I'm said again and again, the percentage of CUPs are coming down. Now, the patient I'm talking about, all these are normal. You've taken blind biopsies, you've done all the endoscopies, you've got a PET CT scan done, nothing shows a primary. At this stage, before we go on to management, we have to learn the basics of tumor biology. Can anybody tell me the lines of progression of malignant tumor? There are three lines of progression described in books. What are they? Have you understood the question? I'm not talking about tumor biomarkers. We will not go into all that. I'm not going to the genetic level of the tumor, etc. That's for MCH, uh, surgical oncology, medical oncology people. Let us stick to ourselves to fundamentals. Because all my classes have been. What are the lines of progression? This is important because that only will explain the management as I come later. To discuss the management, you've got to understand these three lines of progression described in a tumor. Lack of time, I'll proceed. Number one, what you see commonly, the primary tumor starts growing. At a certain stage, the primary tumor is pressed on to involve the lymph nodes, etc. This is what the great Halster described long, long time ago with reference to cancer of breast. He said that the stage where it's localized to a tumor breast, then it goes to axillary lymph nodes, then it goes to a bloodstream. There is one line of progression described in a 
majority of squamous cell carcinoma belong to this group. Luckily for us, it starts as a primary tumor at a certain size and then lymph nodes get enlarged. Spread beyond the lymph nodes is uncommon. I'll come to this point a little later. The second group is where the primary itself rate of growth is rather slow, but for reasons not very clear, the secondary deposits grow at a much more rapid rate compared to the primary tumor. And CUP belongs to this particular group. So stress again, the rate growth of the primary tumor comparatively is slower to that of growth of the metastatic lymph nodes. And this is the group CUP belongs to. The third line of progression is classically seen in cancer of breast. And what is it? So pretty simply, one cell becomes... Fisher two. theory. Yes? Fisher theory. Oh. Fisher theory, right. You are perfectly right. Let me put it in a little more colorful way. One cell becomes two, two cell becomes four. The second cell says, I don't want to stay with my father, and it moves away. It doesn't like the cramped space of the lymph node. It says, let me spread my wings and spread far and wide. The second cell may go and sit in the brain, go and sit in the lung, or sit in the liver. That is parallel growth of primary and secondary. This is the third line of progression. You've got to understand this is a basic tumor biology that is understood by MS postgraduates. By the time you go to MCH level, things become much more deeper, much more complex. I will not discuss that. So go back again, three lines of progression. Primary, reach a certain stage, then only the secondary start growing. Second group, to which our patient belongs, Primary rate of growth is low, but secondary rate of growth is much faster. Third, parallel growth where primary and secondary start multiplying rapidly, simultaneously. Now, before you go on to treatment, you're going to discuss two groups. One is a favorable group, one is an unfavorable group. Favorable groups, as far as Indian patients are concerned, are a very insignificant minority. I'll come to this when I go to treatment. So when you're going to discuss the favorable group, you try to control the disease and look for long-term survival. Unfavorable group, your idea is to give palliative treatment to make the patient comfortable to the minimum possible. Here comes a very important ethical, this is the reason I've discussed this problem. Ethical issues are the one that takes precedence. Unless you understand the ethical issues involved, your treatment is going to be irrational. The point is, are you justified in controlling the secondary tumor without treating the primary? You go back to any other tumor, you have to think of the first the primary tumor, and then only you think of secondaries. Carcinoma cheek, carcinoma lip, carcinoma tongue. You first look at how do I treat the primary. Then I'll decide how to treat the, treat the secondary. Here, we are no primary. So there's no question of treating the primary because the primary has not been detected to the best of abilities, it, despite all the modern, more sophisticated investigations, right? So what are the issues? Now, the reasons why secondaries are treated in this particular instance are the following. Number one, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma come under the group of loco regional cancers. Means what? Means what? Spread beyond the lymph nodes is uncommon, if not rare. Can we tell me in the oral cavity, which is the one cancer is known to produce second is in the lung, hemo uh, spread along the bloodstream. Quick answer, TV. Quick answer. PNM. Nasopharyngeal. No, no. Nasopharynx. Okay, right. Fine. But tongue. oral cancers, what we tongue. tongue. Tongue, yes. Tongue is the most, uh, of all the oral cancers, tongue is the one that grows likely to produce uh, distant metastasis. The rest of them, more often than not, are local regional. Is there any other part of the body where you have local regional cancers, which we are familiar with? And don't talk of margolins. Every day I hear margolins. We'll not talk of margolins today. Three times I already heard the answer. Basal cell carcinoma. Where? Sight? Face. Face. Papre. Penis, my dear young man. We have enough cancer penises in this country. And cancer penis, again, is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma, which remains local, regional in most cases. The idea is, if the disease is local, regional, 
as we come to the next point, treatment of regional cancer adds on to the better prognosis. Understand what I mean? If the tumor were to spread via the bloodstream, for example, melanoma, you know, by the time a melanoma produces lymph nodes, you're pretty sure there are, there are, there are micro metastases elsewhere in the body, you presume, and the presumption is more often right. That I want to understand the biological behavior of these two. You have a squamous cell, which remains local regional. Melanoma starts off in the skin, produces a lymph node enlargement. By the time clinical lymph nodes enlarge are present in a melanoma, the presumption is micro metastases are already present elsewhere in the body. Therefore, it translates into a poor prognosis, which is not true in local region. Second is, if you have to leave this level to a lymph node, that's why I brought that point, it is in close proximity to the great vessels of the neck. And squamous cell carcinoma has got a specific property of eroding through the wall. And all of you know oral cancer. One of the causes of death that is described in all books is massive bleed from erosion of the great vessels. Understand that? So if you are to allow this tumor to progress further, chances are it will erode the great vessels and produce a massive exsanguinary bleed, which ends fatally. So therefore, there's a second reason. Third reason is, when we are, as we learn later, when we are giving radiotherapy, we not only irradiate the area of the second deposit, we also include those possible areas which may harbor a small primary which has not been made out. Right from nasopharynx down, the entire area is irradiated. So God forbid, if there is a small primary tumor, you hope and pray that that particular tumor also gets irradiated and controlled. Lastly, squamous cell carcinoma in general are slow growing. In fact, uh, the textbook I read, INID is to say, Carcinoma of the lip treated early, patient live long enough to develop a second cancer and die. My own experience, I have had seven to eight, I think, people coming back to me, having been treated for squamous cell carcinoma, either in the oral cavity or in the penis, coming back to me with carcinoma of the colon, carcinoma of the stomach, one patient had carcinoma of the ovary, and... Uh, Another, of course, had carcinoma of the lung. He was a smoker, had a carcinoma of the lung. And another patient, 17 years after I treated advanced carcinoma cheek. You know, those days we had very, uh, we didn't have all this plastic surgical, uh, uh, I would say, modern uh, techniques. And the only flap we are very frequently using is the forehead flap, which has probably have been completely given up now. 17 years, I put a forehead flap for a patient with carcinoma of the cheek or the, on the right side. He comes back to me with this carcinoma opposite side. Please remember this important point with oral cancers. Metachronous growths are known to occur in the proximal aerodigestive tract. That means a patient had one carcinoma of the lip, the carcinoma of the tongue or a cheek can develop an independent carcinoma in the entire that area is known as, what is it, a term used? Right. Okay, fine. Excellent answer. In general. But I have put in aggressive letters the last word. What we are dealing with is a totally different kind of fish. We are dealing with an aggressive tumor. That's why now your the lines of progression become important. This particular case does not fit with the general category of squamous cell carcinomas in general, are slow growing, spread occurs if at all only up the lymph nodes. And if you tackle the local regional cancers well, it always translates into a good, or I would use the word excellent prognosis. But this tumor belongs to that line of progression where the primary has remained very small but it produced massive secondaries. So you cannot equate this tumor in general with the characteristics for other squamous cell carcinoma. Unless you understand this slide, you'll never be able to rationalize your treatment. Do I get an answer? Yes. Unless you understand the reasons why you treat, despite the primary not being present or treated, you have to understand this. This is the main reason I am discussing this case today. Right. Now, what do we do? Now, 
what is a favorable group? This is more theoretical from Indian patients. Where you have a single node, N1 or N2A, small in size, obviously, and then the resectable. Those are patients wherein you find the outlook is comparatively better. I'm using the word comparatively better. What do you do? You do a radical neck dissection. Please remember, if the, here, if the sternum asteroid is involved, you will have to take out the uh, sternum asteroid. You may be, able to, they may be able to conserve the interjugular vein. More often than not, accessory now may have to be sacrificed for oncological clearance. There are uh, uh, lesser operations described, but I think till you, for the examination, I would suggest that radical neck is an answer that is satisfied most examiners. There are people who do localized excisions. Their argument is very simple. We know these are aggressive tumors. This patient may come back with primary symptoms and then he has a, the outlook in general is poor. Why sub, uh, subject him to a more radical surgery? But I think oncologically, the best operation for these patients, when feasible, is a radical neck. That is where your CT becomes very important. You must be able to show preoperatively because days of trial dissection are over for uh, completely, no longer. Days gone by, many of these patients wish to explore with the hope of resecting and then find the tumor is adhering to adherent there and give up. That kind of R2 resections in the neck, I don't think is fair with the, all the uh, imaging techniques that you have at your disposal at the present time. Following radical dissection, we always have to give them excellent radiotherapy, EBRT. And here again, the area is not only the operative area in the neck, you also extend your radiotherapy field to involve those possible primary sites. Now, those patients were unfavorable. As I showed you, tumors more than uh, six centimeters in size and three tumors which are fixed. What you do is you give them concurrent chemo radiation. The chemotherapy drug used belongs to, belongs to which group? Platinum. Platinum group, that's right belongs to platinum group. Along with that, 50 to 60 GI is the usual dose that is given. And, and what possible responses you are aware of following uh, concurrent chemo in general, applicable to all malignant tumor, what could happen? What are the possible results of, this is almost like new adjuvant chemo radiation. What are the responses you are aware of? Complete pathology. Complete response, very good. Next. Partial response to partial response, not response. So the third one partial is partial and is no the, response. No, no, there are four options you have to think of. Number one is complete response. Number two, I'm talking in general of all tumors. Number two is partial response. Number three, stable disease remains the same. Number four, progressive disease. What you find in a majority of patients here is partial response. If there is a partial response and you repeat the CT PET scan and the tumor appears to be respectable. I would like to emphasize this point. This happens in a very small minority of patients. Majority of patients, the size may decrease, fixity will not disappear. Remember, post radiation, there may be fibrosis. That's why you have to do a scan. The scan shows involvement of the carotid sheath, which has persisted. There's no point. You can continue. Uh, palliative chemo radiation leave the patient alone. But lucky patients are those wherein there is some response, the tumor has become resectable, they do a radical neck dissection and continue chemo radiation. Means chemotherapy is restricted to that small group of patients wherein you are unfavorable at the first stage. That means you've got tumors more than six centimeters, tumors which are almost fixed, where you know that radical surgery is not feasible under those circumstances, chemotherapy comes into play. Now, uh, I purposely finished early today. Uh, I have taken six classes, and every class there has been some, because I believe that whether a class or a lecture need to have a carry home uh, message. And now, the first cl uh, class I took was uh, basic ulcers and uh, swellings. What are the carry home message you learned? Come on, quickly. What is the carry home message? Quick, quick. I got another 
uh, because two o'clock there is another class. Purposely, I stopped it at 45 minutes. Quick, what's the carry on message? Those who have heard the first class. Anybody? Okay, I'll say that unless you have a firm foundation of fundamentals, you can never build a good superstructure. People tend to take many things for granted, especially at PG level when a teacher comes to you. He, takes, he or she takes many things for granted. Unfortunately, I don't belong to that group. Quite often, I'm not insulting you, but quite often I start with the idea or state the statement that I start with the idea you know nothing. It's better to start at that point and then improve upon. So the first class was primary to show you that fundamentals are important. Okay, now very close, wait. What is it that you carry your message? Quick, 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 quick. I want to finish by 1.55. I don't want to go until 2 o'clock and disturb my very dear friend Santos, John Abraham from Kochi. Quick. Very close vein, we learned after the advent of Doppler that there was one group of secondary varicosity which was missed all the time. And that group was those patients who had anybody? Deep vein valvular incompetency. People are talking about descending flubogram, which was performed only in academic institutions. Many of the patients underwent surgery and became more miserable after surgery because the basic pathology was not in the superficial vein, but was in the deep veins. And unless that, that was tackled, there's no point in treating the superficial vein. And this is what the carrier message in varicose vein, deep vein valvular incompetency was made out only after the advent of color Doppler. Till then, we did not know such a condition existed. Third was parotid. What did you learn in parotid? What do you learn in parotid? Yes, TV, come on, quick. As surgeons, we look in a talk of malignancy, we think of cells, cells and cells alone. All the description revolves around the cell. But here's one pleomorphic adenoma where, in addition to looking at the cell, we looked at the matrix. Why do we look at the matrix? The matrix was higher line, and that is why the word pleomorphism came into existence. We have a group of cells which look like SNI, which was, in addition to that, you find what looked like cartilaginous tissue, and that is nothing but, nothing but metaplasia of the myoepithelial cells. In addition to that, we learn to look at the capsule. It's the capsule that is responsible for recurrence. So from a pathologist's point of view, I'm mean, sorry, a surgical pathologist's point of view, in addition to looking at the cells, we learned that the matrix as well as the capsule are important in studying tumors. That is a carrier message in perote. Okay, now we come to thyroidectomy. What is it we learned? Carrier message. Come on, I thought at least somebody should answer. Otherwise, all this is... Huh? Come on. Number one is very simple, which is applicable to all surgeons, all operations. Unless you obtain absolute hemostasis, don't move forward because parathyroids are recognized by their yellow color and not by feel. We surgeons depend so much on palpation that sometimes inspection is completely forgotten. So this shows that identification of a parathyroid is by the yellow color, so absolute hemos. Number two, I mentioned this last time, people have forgotten. There is a, a very common misconception in the minds of surgeons, the structures that you don't see cannot be damaged. Recurrent laryngeal nerve and common bile duct are two classical examples of getting damaged without being seen. So unless you visualize a structure, you, will, you can't be very sure whether you damage it or not. That's the lesson you learned in open thyroid. I'm not talking about uh, endoscopy and all other things. I'm talking open surgery. Then the last class was TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome. What is the carrier message? The carrier message is very simple. Just like today, it's a diagnosis made by exclusion. Cervical rapes as a cause for neurovascular symptom is the last condition you have to think of to rule out conditions like intervertebral disc prolapse, 
the rural conditions, radiculitis, the rural condition, carpal tunnel, the rural conditions like atherosclerosis, the rural conditions like vasculitis, before you say this rib or this abnormality at the root of the neck is responsible for the symptom that the patient has, is responsible for the condition he has, I'm going to treat it. Otherwise, you'll be unnecessarily doing a scalenotomy and the patient will come back to you. Of course, he won't come back to you. He thinks there's a better surgeon, so I'll swear and goes to somebody else. So TAO is a diagnosis made by exclusion. I'm coming to today's class. A message I want you to carry is a rare condition, but unfortunately, some of this, you know, especially the oncology department being present in most medical colleges, some of these conditions got uncanny habit of appearing only during exam time. You prepone the exam, they come early. You postpone the exam, they come late. And if there's a short case of a lymph node like this, you can be rest assured that such a patient come for the MS examination. And you have to learn, I repeat again, the rationale behind treatment of the secondaries. This is a very uncommon condition. 99.99% of the situation, you treat the primary first and then only think of treating the secondaries, if at all. Here is one condition. We do not know the primary. We are not identified a primary, but still we are justified in treating the secondary. That's a carry on message. With that, I would like to thank Dr. Pata Radhakrishnan, who has taken immense trouble. Can you come on the screen, please, Pata? Let me see your beautiful face. <laughs> oh, thank you. Special thanks, because actually what you have done for me is, I can only use the word, waking up from a, a deep stage of hibernation, because it's been years before I took a class, and thanks to your generosity, I've been able to take, I think, six classes. So thank you very much, Dr. Radha Krishna. With that, it's you our, want to say something? It's our honor and privilege, sir, to have you with us. And you know, the younger generation is so lucky to see and hear you. We want to hear you every single day, as long as we we, we can we can run this show during the lockdown, sir. So we we want at one o'clock slot uh, permanently, and uh, we. No, 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 no. The point is, I must be competent enough to talk. Things have changed so much, Baba. The, the, no basics, huh? basics are important, as you say, sir. Change things. Everybody talks, but the basics, very few talk. So actually, I myself get inspired listening to you and your voice, and the sincerity with which you speak, sir. So we. We are very lucky. I, I, I am lucky to see you, hear you, and uh, talk to you. And I'm sure all the students will agree with me. And uh, 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 today we have still 10 more minutes, sir. If any, anybody wants to ask you anything, and yeah, yeah. we'll see you again tomorrow morning, tomorrow at the same time, sir. Yeah, anyone wants a question? Anyone want to ask anything? See. Uh, with, uh, yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, the carotid involvement is always a counterindication for next My surgery. dear girl, I am talking at MS postgraduate level. If you yes. go to MCH, surgical uh, oncology, there are people who take out the carotid, there are people who do everything possible. Understand yes, that? So, your examiners are basically general surgeons. They are not yes, surgical oncologists. If you are um, willing to say that I am going to resect the carotid and and replace with the graft. You got competency, depends upon the problem here is at what level. This is a tumor that extends well almost up to the base skull. If you yes, operate sir. on these patients, realize the practical problem that you face. You are going to expose the carotid interjugular vein naked almost from the base skull down. Understand what I mean? Yes, so you should have a healthy segment for you to reconstruct. Number one. Number two, the common, okay, now you are invited, you know, in the exam, there are certain questions known as questions by invitation. You have put this idea into my mind. Now, if the common character is involved, if you plan to resect it, what could be the options and what are the possible results? This is a class, I'm happy that this girl has asked this question because in the examination, 50% of the questions are by what I call questions by invitation. You invite the examiner to ask this question by your own response. Come on, tell me. Mm -hmm. Common carotid is encased by the tumor. Uh, sir, yeah. up to 180 degree encasement, uh, it can be, uh, the tumor can be removed and uh, 
surgery can be proceeded. It was mentioned in ACS. Does the circular will is come to a discussion at this stage, madam? Sir? Does the circular will is come into the discussion at this stage? Uh, no, sir. It does. So what do you uh, what have you got to do? So to prove that yes, sir. maybe MRI NG or something to make sure the circular willis is complete. You cannot hope the vertebral artery to feed. If the patient may have hemiplegia in opposite side, please, yeah. and today will be hauled up in the court of law before being arrested by the police. So be careful. No, no. I'm, I see. I have restricted myself to. I don't know. Radha Krishna is the right person to answer this. Is this adequate? Should we go further? Because to my mind, unless you are going on to MCS surgical oncology, the tumor markers and the various biochemical factors, and then reconstruction with you know, long uh, carotid replacement, etc., come at a higher stage where you have got the expertise needed for that. Many government medical mm -hmm. colleagues, with due apologies, I am not casting aspersions, do not have this kind of expertise unless you are in a medical. Mm -hmm. Today, every district has a medical college, almost at least in South India, I don't know not. And at district headquarters, you are the only surgeon who is capable. There's nobody beyond you. Somebody has written today, most corporate hospitals do not have general surgeons at all. They are specially uh, surgeons for all possible specialities. And uh, I don't I don't want to continue the discussion, it goes on some other lines. So okay, at MS yeah. level, I still feel encasement of the carotid is a contraindication. Yes, sir. Thank when you. examiners ask you, are there possible reconstructive, then you can mm -hmm. go further. Understand what I mean? You look yes, at the examiner's response. If he's one of those believes in carotid reconstruction, he's going to ask you, and then your justified answer. Otherwise, safer to restrict yourself to encasement is a contraindication. Understand yes, what sir. I mean? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, right. I'm happy sir, because, uh, yes, please, any more question? Sir, how do you proceed with uh, varicose veins and concomitant deep vein thrombosis? How do you proceed with? A varicose veins with a concomitant deep vein thrombosis, sir. Deep vein thrombosis, the varicosity is secondary. You treat the deep vein thrombosis and not the varicose vein. All that you need to do is to apply a nice pressure bandage. Even sclero is dangerous because the blood is carried by the superficial venous system. Those who attended, I don't know, remember the first slide I put. I put that when you examine the patient, I compared to a mythological episode in the, our Hindu mythology, where Lord Ganesha goes around Lord Shiva. You got to do the same thing. You got to look at the popliteal fossa. You got to look at the back of the thigh in broad, good light because Dilated veins on the back of the thigh is an indirect evidence of DVT. When a patient, these are silent DVTs, these are chronic DVTs. I stressed all these points. Homer stress, all the stress are negative. There is no calf muscle tenderness. The clue you have is a swelling. Proximal swelling is more than the distal swelling. That's why I put a picture of a champagne bottle. Understand? But it does not resemble the champagne bottle in that the leg look, uh, looks perfectly normal like the lower part because you have lipodermatosclerosis. In fact, uh, luckily the disease is now almost eradicated. Many a patient with filarial limb, you see gross swelling in the distal part of the limb. The thigh segment is not involved. DVT is exactly opposite. The side thigh segment is always very much swollen. Compared to that, the leg segment is less swollen, but you may find other evidence like pigmentation, etc. When there is DVT, focus your attention on DVT. Chronic DVT, you cannot dissolve because I said last time, recanalization already occurred. Recanalized veins are only non-functioning venous tubes. They have no valves. They do not have a muscular wall in the medial cord. They do not perform like a normal vein functionally. I went to the extent of saying, these are patients where a Perthes test gives you a false positive. The patient does not complain of pain because some blood has gone through this tube, but they are not functioning like a normal. You treat the DVT and not the vein. Are you happy? Thank you so much, sir. Okay. It's been a pleasure, sir, listening to your lectures. A pleasure. It's been, Baba.
On that note, uh, we'll close the session today, sir. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so little much. Louder, little louder. Uh, we would love to see you again at one o'clock tomorrow, sir. Uh, I don't know. Let me think about it. I thought this, you know, there's so many youngsters. I'm sure Radha Krishna must be flooded with requests uh, to talk to postgraduates. So, <laughs> an old man like this coming out of hibernation. No, sir, we, uh, uh, old is always gold, sir. We no, no. They do one thing then. Kindly pass on possible subjects to our convener, Dr. Radha Krishna. If I feel that I can add on something, I'm the first person to come and join you. Understand? I should be able to contribute something positively, Baba. It's not like making a harikatha and saying the same thing again and again. You must learn something at that. That's why I said I repeated the carry home message. That's why I perfectly stopped much ahead of time. I think it's two minutes to two. Radha Krishna, thank you very thank much. You, sir. Thanks. Okay, if as and when the need arises, okay. if I think the topic is relevant to me and to the PGs, I'll be the first person to join you. Okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.